Hey guys, Uncommon Ramen here. Uh, before I jump into the video, let me remind you if you like the content, please go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, if you want to know when the content is coming out, uh, hit the bell icon so you can be notified as the episodes hit YouTube. Um, also, if you feel the need to support me, hit me up on my Patreon at patreon.com slash Uncommon Ramen, capital U, capital R. Uh, I do all this in my free time, so any amount of support can help me bring more of the content to you more often. Uh, without further ado, we are going to do yet another deck tech um, while we wait for Double Masters 2022 to come out. Um, today we are going to be taking a look at Cyrix, Carrier of the Flame. Um, this is the first time that they ever printed a Legendary Phoenix, and that doesn't mean that you can't make a uh, Phoenix tribal deck in Commander, but, um, you know, what good would it be without a legendary Phoenix heading the, uh, the uh, battle? So anyway, we're going to take a look at this real quick. We have Cyrix, Carrier of the Flame. Uh, this is four in Rakdos colors. So another interesting thing about this uh, is that it is Rakdos colors, and it could have easily been a mono red. Um, there are, as far as my knowledge it extends, and I, I did pretty good research on this, there is no other uh, Rakdos colored Phoenix, and there are no black Phoenixes either. Um, so it having Rakdos colors wasn't necessary, but I still see it as a great thing, um, because that means that while we can stick mostly in red, we have available to us some of the better uh, Rakdos kill spells as well as black kill spells. Um, again, I build on average, so it's not like we're going to see some of the best cards available. I just put together what, um, based on tons and tons of deck lists, what I thought was the best uh, grouping of cards. So anyway, uh, Cyrix, Carry of the Flame, 4 for 3-3 Flying Haste. Uh, at the beginning of each end step, if a creature left your graveyard this turn, target Phoenix you control deals damage equal to its power to any target. And whenever another Phoenix you control dies, you may cast Cyrix, Carry of the Flame from your graveyard. So Cyrix is really good at avoiding commander attacks. And then on top of that, um, has a, a, a very similar feel to Warstorm Surge. Uh, whenever something leaves your graveyard. Um, and this is going to happen often, obviously, because we're playing uh, Phoenixes. Um, don't get me wrong, there, there are like four or maybe even five Phoenixes that literally do not have a way of coming out of the graveyard. Very strange thing. Um, some of them are a bit older, so it makes sense. Um, but we're going to take a look at the creatures next. And obviously a large portion of these creatures are going to be Phoenixes, but we're going to see some other interesting uh, creatures in here that uh, really synergize well with phoenixes or kind of have similarities with phoenixes. So starting off with the Akum Firebird. This is four for a three, three flying haste. Akum Firebird attacks each turn if able. And for landfall, uh, you can pay four and two red to return Akum Firebird from the graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, so that's just a good example of a recursion theme. This is more typical of uh, Phoenix's recursion. Uh, a lot of the time they either return back to your hand um, or they have a cost that's very similar to their casting costs, sometimes more, most of the time more, um, to return them back to the field. Next we have Ash Cloud Phoenix 4 for a 4-1 flying. When Ash Cloud Phoenix dies, return it to the battlefield face down. Uh, you can morph uh, Ash Cloud, Cloud Phoenix for 4 and 2 red, and when Ash Cloud Phoenix is turned face up, it deals 2 damage to each player. So it's an interesting, um, I guess I wouldn't necessarily call it a super threat there, but it is, it's an interesting little card that helps deal incremental damage, and um, I mean, it's going to constantly be coming back. Uh, if it dies while it's morphed, that's kind of where you get stuck with it, but you know, we have ways of bringing it back either way. Next we have Aurora Phoenix. Uh, this one's six for a five three flying cascade. Uh, whenever you cast a spell with cascade, return Aurora Phoenix from the graveyard to your hand. So this is probably the least reliable Phoenix in my deck uh, because I do not have anything else in the deck with cascade. Um, 
and you might be wondering why I'm running it. Uh, there are ways to reoccur phoenixes in this deck without having to use their own ability. Um, and that is going to come into play more often than not because some of these abilities are really uh, expensive to pay for. So trying to recur multiple phoenixes can be very difficult. Um, as far as Aurora Phoenix, it is 6 for 5, 3 body with flying. So it's got a huge body. Um, and between all the phoenixes, there was about two other phoenixes that I might switch it out for. Uh, the first of which being Chandra's Phoenix, which I'm not running a Chandra Planeswalker in here, so it would have lost out on half of its recursion. And the other Phoenix being Arclight Phoenix, and I'm just not running a huge amount of... Is there a fly around here? Uh, I'm not running uh, a huge amount of instants and sorceries uh, that would be, I guess, cheap enough or uh, have enough recursion to uh, really justify having the Arclight Phoenix. So, Aurora Phoenix it is. Next up we have Chainer, Nightmare Adept. This is one of the few things that are in here that reoccur Phoenixes without actually needing to use their recursion cost. You can discard a card, and you may cast a creature spell from your graveyard this turn, uh, and you can activate this only once each turn. Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if you didn't cast it from your hand, it gains haste until uh, end of next or until your next turn. So this is really good because um, some of these, like if we look earlier, we have the Akum Firebird. It costs six to bring it back from the graveyard uh, to the battlefield, whereas the Akum Firebird itself only really costs four. So with Chainer, you can discard a card, uh, probably a Phoenix, or you'll see some other really good ideas for that. Um, to uh, re to to cast the Akum Firebird for its actual mana cost, and then when it enters the battlefield, it enters with haste, and that's a big thing too, because despite the fact that this is a red deck, a large <clears throat> large portion of these phoenixes uh, do not have haste. Next up, we have Everquill Phoenix. Uh, this one is four for a four four mutate for four with flying. Uh, whenever this creature mutates, create a red artifact token named Feather with one Sacrifice Feather. Uh, return target Phoenix card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Uh, typically, you could use it to target this guy, but really, honestly, that Phoenix Feather can target any of the Phoenixes in this deck. Um, so uh, this is just a really uh, great card to have in here. And because there's so many other ways to reoccur Phoenixes, um, this guy can come back without his own Feather token, um, and really just help with the synergy of the deck. Next we have Firewing Phoenix, 4 for a 4-2 four two, four two flying. Uh, for 1 and 3 red, return Firewing Phoenix from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, this is pretty simple. Next up we have Flame Wake Phoenix, 3 for a 2-2 two two flying haste. Flame Wake, Flame Wake Phoenix attacks each turn if able. And it has Ferocious at the beginning of combat on your turn. If you control a creature with power 4 or greater, you may pay 1 red. If you do, return Flame Wake Phoenix from your graveyard to uh, the battlefield. So this one's actually relatively cheap to bring out, but it does require 4 power or more. Which isn't that hard in this deck. Next we have Fra Flame Wreathed Phoenix. Flame Wreathed Phoenix. Um, this one is 4 for a 3-3 Flying Tribute 2. Um, basically, as this creature enters the battlefield, an opponent of your choice may place two 1-1 one, one counters on it, making a 5-5. Five, five. However, if it enters the battlefield and tribute wasn't paid, uh, it gains haste and when this creature dies, return it to its owner's hand. So if you pay the tribute, it does not have haste and it does not have a phoenix recursion ability. Um, if you do not pay the tribute, then of course it can reoccur like a normal phoenix, which is... Um, it has its ups and downs, but like I said, there are a lot of ways to reoccur things outside of the Phoenix's own abilities, so I'm not too worried about it losing its ability to reoccur itself. Next up, we have Flare of the Hatebound. This is 6 for a 4-2 Undying. Uh, so basically, when this creature dies, if it had no plus 1 plus encounters on it, return to the battlefield under your owner's uh, under its owner's control with a plus 1 plus encounter, so it'll come back as a 5-3. Uh, whenever Flare of the Hatebound or another creature enters the battlefield from your graveyard... That creature deals damage equal to its power to any target. So another similar to Warstorm Surge effect here. Next up we have Immortal Phoenix. This is 6 for a 5-3 flying. When Immortal Phoenix dies, return it to its owner's hand. Pretty simple stuff right there. Next we have Kuldotha Phoenix. 
Uh, this is five for a four four flying haste with metalcraft. You can pay four and return Kuldotha, Kuldotha Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield, but you can only activate this ability during your upkeep and only if you control three or more artifacts. This isn't going to be too hard to do. Um, rocks are pretty prevalent in any commander deck, so this kind of just comes back as long as you have mana rocks. Next we have Lightning Phoenix, three for a 2-2 flying haste. Lightning Phoenix cannot block. Uh, at the beginning of your end step, if an opponent was dealt three or more damage this turn, you may pay one red. If you do, return Lightning Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, it's just a really super fast Phoenix. Next up, we have Magma Phoenix. This is five for a 3 3 flying. When Magma Phoenix is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, it deals three damage to each creature and each player. Um, it's so it kind of functions like a board wipe. Um, it can actually hit your own stuff too, which has a pretty steep downside. Um, for 3 and 2 red, you can return Magma Phoenix from your graveyard to your hand. So you can pay its mana cost to put it in play. Then when it dies, you can pay its mana cost to put it back into your hand, just so you have to pay its mana cost to put it back into play. But hey, again, this is kind of typical for Phoenixes. Next we have Nemesis Phoenix. This is 3... Or I'm sorry, this is 5. Um, 3 and 2 red. Uh, it has flying, it's 4-2. You can pay 2 and a red and return Nemesis Phoenix to, from your graveyard to the battlefield, tapped and attacking, but you can only activate this ability um, if you're during your declare attack step and only if you're attacking two or more opponents. So this is perfect for Commander, uh, which is, I mean, it came out in Commander Legends uh, Battle for Baldur's Gate, so it was obviously conditioned for Commander. Uh, next up, we have Phoenix of Ash. Uh, this guy is three for a 2-2 flying haste. Uh, you can pay two and a red to give Phoenix of Ash plus two plus O until end of turn. It has escape for two and two red. Uh, exile three other cards from your graveyard and return Phoenix of Ash uh, to the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it. Next, we have Reassembling Skeleton. This is two for a 1-1. One, one. Uh, for one and a black, you can return Reassembling Skeleton from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Um, this is a fantastic target for any of these things in, our, in my deck that are going to cause you to sacrifice one of your own creatures, um, amongst other targets. Next, we have Rekindling Phoenix. This guy is four for a 4-3 four, flying. When, re when Rekindling Phoenix dies, create a 0-1 red elemental creature token with, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice a creature... Sacrifice this creature and return target card named Rekindling Phoenix from the graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste until end of turn. Next we have Shard Phoenix. This is 5 for a 2-2 flying. Sacrifice Shard Phoenix. Shard Phoenix deals 2 damage to each creature without flying. Uh, for 3, you can return Shard Phoenix from your graveyard to your hand. Play the ability, yeah, play the ability only during your upkeep. Uh, so this guy is... Um, Kind of like the Magma Phoenix, except it doesn't hit uh, flying creatures, so your creatures, for the most part, are safe. And it, de it only deals two damage, um, but that two damage is enough to take out some of the smaller threats, especially if somebody's trying to do a token strategy where they kind of swing wide. This helps to eliminate that. Then we have Shivan Phoenix. This is six for a 3-4 flying. When Shivan Phoenix is put into a graveyard from play, return Shivan Phoenix to its owner's hand. We got Skargan Phoenix. Or Firebird. Skargan Firebird. This is 6 for a 3-3 three, three with Bloodthirst 3. So when an opponent was dealt damage this turn, uh, it enters the battlefield with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. It has Flying, and for 3, return it from uh, your graveyard to your hand. Activate the ability only if an opponent was dealt damage this turn. Uh, we're playing a relatively aggressive deck, and 90% of the creatures in here have Flying, probably more than 90%. Um, so the idea of your opponent taking damage during their turn is, is kind of gonna happen and more importantly we're in the color of red so we have burn spells although they're s somewhat limited we use them for spot removal more or less um but we're mo more than likely going to be dealing uh three or, th or some sort of damage to my opponent next up we have skyfire phoenix uh this one is four for a three three flying haste whenever you cast your commander return skyfire phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield um, this one is very commander specific, um, and it makes sense to be in this deck. Uh, they kind of work off of each other, so Cyrix can cast itself from the graveyard if a phoenix dies, so if your Skyfire Phoenix dies, you can cast Cyrix from your graveyard, and then when you cast Cyrix from your graveyard, you get Skyfire Phoenix back. Next up we have Squee Goblin to Bob. The 
uh, most phoenix type creature that isn't a phoenix. Uh, Squee Goblin Nabob says at the it's sorry three for a one one at the beginning of your upkeep if uh, you may return Squee Goblin Nabob from your graveyard to your hand. And then we have Squee the Immortal. This one is three for a two one. You may cast Squee the Immortal from your graveyard or from exile. Then we have Sunstreak Phoenix, four for a four two flying. If it's neither day or night, uh, it becomes day as Sunstreak Phoenix enters the battlefield. Whenever you, whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, you may pay one in red. If you do, return Sunstreak Phoenix from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So downside being that it returns to the battlefield tapped, but the upside being that it costs very little by comparison to most Phoenixes to put it back onto the battlefield. Next we have Sir Conrad the Grim. It only makes sense to have this card in here, uh, and because they gave us black to work with, obviously we got to play this. Uh, it is five for a five four. Whenever another creature dies or a creature card is put into the graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield or a creature card leaves your graveyard, Sir Conrad the Grim deals one damage to each opponent. It also has its own self mill. Uh, each player for for two, each player puts the top card of their library into the graveyard. Next we have Torian Mahler. Um, Torian Mahler is a Phoenix by extension. Uh, it is three for a two two uh, with Changeling. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on uh, Torian Mahler. So not only does it count as a Phoenix because it's Changeling, um, every time your opponent casts a spell, it gets plus one plus one. Um, well, it gets a plus one plus one counter, which means it could get really out of hand really quickly. Um, I've seen this on a ton of different um, commanders. Uh, 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 YouTube formats, and every time I've seen somebody play it, it gets really big and really out of hand really quickly, and people have to find answers for it pretty fast. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't have is trample, so you don't have to worry, or flying for that matter. So um, you, you do have the chance to chump block it, but it will get ugly very quickly. Next up, we have Tormod the Desecrator. This is four for a 4-2 whenever one or more cards leave your graveyard. Uh, put a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. Um, this is not quite a Sir Conrad, but if we have things leaving the graveyard anyway, why not create an army of 2-2 zombies while we're at it? Next, we have Viserys Seer. This is one for a 1-1. One, one. You can sacrifice a creature to scry one. Um, it's just a nice sack outlet to have, and with Sir Conrad, this um, is a, a good synergy. And then finally, we have Warcry Phoenix. This is four for a 2-2 Flying Haste. Uh, whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may pay uh, two in a red. If you do, return Warcry Phoenix from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking. So it is a fairly simple way of bringing it back into play, and it doesn't uh, cost an arm and a leg to do so. Sorry about that. Next up, we are going to take a look at instants. Like I said, we didn't focus on instants. This is a tribal deck, so there's less in the way of instants and sorcery, so we can make room for more creatures. But we start with a braid. Two, uh, a braid. Uh, sorry, two. Choose one. A braid deals three damage to target creature or destroy target artifact. So we got a little bit of spot removal in both the artifact and creature realm there. Next, we have Bedevil. This is three, destroy target artifact, creature, or planeswalker. Next, we have Chaos Warp. Three, the owner of target permanent shuffles it into their library, then reveals the top card of their library. If it's a permanent card, they put it onto the battlefield. Next, we have Deadly Dispute. Two, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice an artifact or creature, uh, draw two cards, then create a treasure token. So this is really cool in this deck because, again, we're playing Phoenixes with the Recursion, but we also have both the Squeeze and we have... Um, uh, reassembling Skeleton. Not to mention we have Chainer to bring things back, so there's a lot of uh, targets for this. And again, Tormod is creating zombies, so you can choose a token even. Right? Yeah, cool. Uh, then we have Malakir Rebirth. This is one. Uh, choose target creature. You lose two life until end of turn. That creature gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield, tapped under its owner's control. Um, just another way to reoccur things. Um, it still technically hits the graveyard. Um, worst case scenario, you can use Malakir Rebirth as a swamp that comes into play tapped. So if you're really starving for land. Next up, we have Rakdos Charm. Two, choose one. Exile, to, uh, exile all cards from target player's graveyard. 
destroy target artifact, or each creature deals one damage to its controller. Next we have Terminate. This is two for destroy target creature, can't be regenerated. Next we have Thrill of Possibility as an additional cost to cast this spell. Discard a card, draw two cards. Um, this is really good with Squee Goblin to Bob, um, just because during your upkeep you can just bring the Goblin to Bob back to your hand after you discard it. Next up we have Village Rights, one as an additional cost to cast this spell. Sacrifice a creature, draw two cards. Next we're going to take a look at the Sorcery. Starting with Blasphemous Act. Uh, it costs one less for each creature on the battlefield. Blasphemous Act deals 13 damage to each creature. Followed by Buried Alive. Three, search your library for up to three creature cards. Put them into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. This is a great way to start getting phoenixes into your graveyard and reoccurring them. Although, like I said, you'd have to pick some of the cheaper phoenixes because some of the more expensive phoenixes are going to have to wait till end, uh, late game anyway, or mid game anyway. Next up, we have Cathartic Reunion, uh, two as an additional cost to cast the spell. Discard two cards and then draw three. Then we have Faithless Looting, uh, one, draw two cards, then discard two cards, and flashback for two in red. Next we have Feed the Swarm, uh, two, destroy target creature or enchantment an opponent controls. Uh, you lose life equal to that permanent's converted mana cost. Next up, we have Jessica's Will. This is uh, three. Choose one. If you control a commander as you cast the spell, you may choose both. Um, add red mana for each card in target opponent's hand. Or, and or, I should say. Exile the top three cards of your library. You may play them this turn. Next, we have Patriarch's Bidding. This is five. Each player chooses a creature type. Each player returns all creature cards of that type of the chosen type uh, from their graveyard to the battlefield. So a quick way to bring all your Phoenix backs, Phoenixes back uh, because after a while it's going to become way too expensive to bring them back all at the same time. Um, this will just do it for you. Then we have Reanimate. Uh, one for put target card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. So you can do this to target your opponent's stuff as well, but uh, in worst case scenario, yeah, you can you can target your own stuff. Then we have Vandal Blast. Uh, this one is one destroy target artifact you don't control. It has overload for five um, to destroy all artifacts you don't control. Then we have Victimize. Three, choose two target creature cards in your graveyard. Sacrifice a creature. If you do, return the chosen cards from your all right, cards to the battlefield tap from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Um, again, this works really well with, uh, in this case, Squee, Goblin, Immortal, um, or even Squee, Goblin, to Bob. So as long as either of them are in the graveyard, they're going to come back to either the battlefield or to your hand. Um, but again, it also works really well with Reassembling Skeleton and really any of the Phoenixes. Um, it is fantastic recursion for this deck. Next, we're going to take a look at artifacts. There's actually several good artifacts in here. Um, all right, starting with Ashnod's Altar, you can sacrifice a creature to add two colorless mana to your mana pool. Um, yeah, I'm running this instead of Phyrexian Altar. Phyrexian Altar is significantly more expensive in the front in the form of uh, monetary value and um i know it's getting a reprint soon so you know maybe i'll end up switching it out but this gives me two colorless as opposed to one of a specific color and i think that this is actually a little bit better in this deck considering the amount of uh phoenixes that cost like six to bring back from the graveyard so ashnod's altar next up we have arcane signet uh for two you can tap it um, add one mana of any color of your commander's color identity. Uh, then we have Desecrated Tomb. This is three. Whenever one or more creature cards leaves your graveyard, uh, create a 1-1 one, one, uh, black bat creature token with flying. Uh, again, so we're already having things leave the graveyard, so why not use Tormod? Why not use Desecrated Tomb? Um, yeah, we're not going for that swing-wide strategy, but hey, these tokens can be sacrificed. In this case, these are flying tokens, so they're harder to deal with. Um, I see no problem with extra value. Next, we have Felwar Stone. Uh, two, um, you can tap it to add one mana of any color a land your opponent controls could uh, produce. Then we have Haz Hazret Monument. This is three red creature spells you cost. Cast one, 
ca cost cast. Uh, you cast cost one less to cast, and whenever you cast a creature spell, you may discard a card. If you do, draw a card. Next up, we have Harold's Horn. As Harold's Horn enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creature spells of the chosen type cost one less to cast. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you can look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature of the chosen type, you may reveal that card and put it into your hand. So it gives you extra draw if you end up finding a phoenix. Um, very good card. Next up, we have Mindstone. Two, you can tap it for uh, colorless, or you can tap one and it, sacrifice it to draw a card. And we have Rakdos Signet. You can tap, or you pay two and you can pay one to tap it for Rakdos colors. Soul Ring, one to tap for two. Talisman of Indulgence, you can tap two, or you can pay two, and then you can tap it for colorless, or you can tap it for red and black, or black, um, but it deals one damage to you if you do it that way. Lastly, we got Vanquisher's Banner. This is five. As Vanquisher's Banner enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Uh, creatures of the chosen type get plus one, plus one, and whenever you cast a creature of the chosen type, you get to draw a card. Right up there with Vanquisher's Banner, or I mean, uh, uh, Harold's Horn. Next, we're going to take a look at some enchantments, and there's actually, I think, seven different enchantments in here, which is very... Well, it's it's pretty high for my typical. All right, starting with Goblin Bombardment. This is two. You can sacrifice a creature. Goblin Bombardment deals one damage to any target. Um, this is a great way to cinch a game closed. Uh, I use this as a last couple of incremental damage to kill someone. Um, it is actually phenomenal. Uh, when I was putting this in here, I was hesitant to put it in here. I wanted to use it in uh, a modern deck, and um, first off, I realized that it's super cheap to get right now, um, and then secondly, after having a chance to play it, I realized just how good it is to have it in here for that extra oomph. Next, we have Molten Echoes. This is four. As Molten Echoes enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Uh, whenever a non-token creature of the, cho of the chosen type enters the battlefield under your control, create a token that is a copy of that creature. That token gains haste, and then you exile it at the beginning of your next untap step. So you get you ba basically can get in some uh, extra damage. Um, not all the time. Obviously, if your opponents can block, they'll try to, but um, it's just kind of a neat little aggressive way to really keep sticking it to your opponents. Next, we have Phyrexian Reclamation. Cost one, you can pay two and two life to return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Another good reoccursion, it's an enchantment. Um, you pay two life. This is the uh, commander format. Paying two life isn't that big of a deal. Um, at least early game and even mid game, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and it gets some of those cards that are harder to reoccur back into play. Next, we have Shared on Animosity. Uh, this is three. Whenever a creature you control attacks, it gets plus one plus oh for each other. Or until end of turn for each other attacking creature that shares a creature type with it. Um, so just makes your phoenixes that much more aggressive. Next we have Sunbird's Invocation. Uh, this is six. Whenever you cast a spell from your hand, reveal the top X cards from your library, where X is the spell's mana cost, well, mana value. Um, you may cast a spell with mana value X or less from among those cards revealed, uh, and without paying its mana cost, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's kind of like Cascade, but it's not Cascade. So it doesn't affect the Aurora Phoenix, but in this deck, it is such a phenomenal way to fill the board. Next up, we have Tortured Existence. Uh, one black, you can pay one black, choose and discard a creature card, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Again, to get some of those harder to reoccur phoenixes back into uh, play. And then finally, we have Warstorm Surge. Uh, this is six. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature or player. So we got a couple of these in the deck, and it just adds to that really aggressive feel where we're going to be dealing damage as in, in any way that we can possibly find a way to do so. Okay, now finally we're going to take a look at Planeswalkers. Uh, there is one in here. I chose to use Liliana Dreadhorde General. A lot of decks are using a version of Chandra. Um, I can't remember the name that they were using specific, or the name of the one they were using specifically. Um, it does work really well with 
Chandra's Phoenix. Um, but I chose to run Dreadhorde General for a couple reasons here. Whenever a creature you control dies, uh, draw a card. Not only are we expecting our creatures to die, we may even kill our own creatures via sacrifice and they reoccur so they are going to be coming back and dying quite often so i think the draw card engine from this is very solid for a plus one you get to create a 2-2 black zombie creature token um so we're just adding to that army for our minus four each player sacrifices two creatures which is fantastic again i don't mind sacrificing creatures and again whenever a creature i control dies i get to draw cards so and then finally it's minus nine each opponent chooses a permanent they control and sacrifices the rest so it's kind of like a board wipe although you have to keep liliana protected in order in order to use it um but you know really good minus nine <laughs> all right we're going to take a look at non basic land All right, we got ourselves a Blight Step Pathway. So this turns into Seer Step Pathway on the other side. Uh, one taps for one, or red, one taps for black. Next we have our Blood Crypt. This is the Shock Land for red, black. Next we have the Blood Stained Mire. This is the Fetch Land for red, black. Got ourselves a Bajuka Bog when it enters the battlefield. Um, exile all cards from target player's graveyard. Taps for black. Command Tower, you can tap it for your color commander's color identity. Dragon Skull Summit, check land for red black. Foreboding Ruins, this one is a reveal land for red black. Haunted Ridge, another check land for red black. Path of Ancestry, um, you can tap it to add one mana of your colors commander's color identity. Um, and when you use it to cast a creature that shares a type with your commander, uh, you get to scry one. Rakdos Carnarium is the bounce land for red-black. Smoldering Marsh is another check land for red-black. This one is checking for two or more basic lands. We got Tainted Peak. Uh, you can tap it for colorless, or you can tap it for red-black, but you can only do that if you control a swamp. And finally, we're going to take a look at the basic lands. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen mountains. And one, two, three, four, five swamps. All right, guys, that is the Cyrix Carrier of the Flame Phoenix Tribal Deck. Uh, red, black. So we got our Rakdos colors going here. Um, honestly, this is kind of a mixture between a really aggressive flying deck that utilizes things like Flare the Hatebound or Warstorm Surge or even Cyrix's own ability to deal damage in any way we can. Also using things like Goblin Bombardment to um, essentially get in some extra damage and then take advantage of those recursion abilities. Uh, but it, it's also a mixture of kind of an aristocrats type deck with a, with uh, several different sack outlets and a card like uh, Sir Conrad to kind of uh, deal incremental damage. And on top of that, we have other strategies like the Tormod and Desecrated Tomb in order to create a token army that can be used either as chump blockers for protection or just kind of as more sacrifice fodder. So it's just a really interesting deck. I've played it a couple of times now, and um, I, I'm not going to say, again, because it's built to the average, I'm not going to say this thing is such a phenomenal uh, deck that everyone should go out there and build it. Uh, what I will say is that the couple of times that I've played it, um, the games were down to the wire. Um, and this really does prove to be an extremely aggressive deck. Um, there's a lot going on in here as far as re return mechanisms, so you kind of have to have a lot of time to think about what you want to return and how much mana you want to pay for it. Some of the stuff only returns during your upkeep, so you're going to be paying that mana during your upkeep, which means that if you're not... Um, if you have other things you'd like to cast, you have to be pretty careful about that. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, leave those down below. Um, 
but let's keep these comments positive. Uh, I'll be removing any negative comments uh, because we just don't need that here. And guys, until next time, peace.